Thanks very much for this nice introduction and thanks um, for the invitation to this great conference. Uh, I think I'm in a, in a way the discomforting element from somebody coming over from over the channel <laughs> providing some, some different view. Um, okay, at least I attempt to, 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 to find a comparative perspective. Let's see whether this uh, will turn out in the end. In June 1917, the German troops were issued an order forbidding them to fire a single shot during silent periods and particularly when the east wind was strong. Due to the British troops' excellent methods of locating gunfire through sound ranging, the risk of an immediate retaliation was simply too great. Should a German soldier, soldier nevertheless take the opportunity to shoot, troops of neighboring artillery positions were ordered to fire a divi divisionary volley to minimize the effectiveness of sound ranging. This small episode in which the Germans rather awkwardly attempted to circumvent the British's effectively mobilized acoustic surveillance methods sheds not only light on the relationships between the relationship between science and technology and war in the First World War, it also highlights to which extent combat turned from the visual, where you can see the enemy and can take aim at them, to more indirect inferences drawn from the use of sound technologies. Troops dug in and holding out in fortified trenches and later also airships and aircraft hidden in the clouds made listening a new challenge to the combatant. The naked ear, the order also suggests, had been replaced by more reliable acoustic technology. Two points become immediately apparent. First, there occurred a far-reaching shift during the course of the First World War, which had started with traditional equipment and tactics when, in, when, when innovative science was able to produce rather radical military consequences. This was, not generally, this was not generally the case as both gas warfare and the tank, to give just two examples, did rather play a symbolic than a decisive military role. Second, the example of sound ranging turns our attention to the role of physicists and mathematicians in a war that has so often been titled the War of Chemists. In this talk, I shall discuss the mobilization and self-mobilization of scientists during the war based in particular on the case of sound ranging. I shall furthermore compare these developments across France, Great Britain, and Germany. I then discuss some resulting repercussions on fundamental research innovations in the post-war era in these three countries. The comparative perspective may reveal, to borrow from Jeffrey Allen and Roy McLeod, not only important similarities, but also extremely different social and institutional orientations and capacities to adapt and, to, and respond to the unexpected exigencies of total war. In the case of ballistics, to be sure, concerns the transformation of a long established scientific method. The First World War, however, exposed the deficits of the traditional form of ballistics, which had failed to meet the new demands of warfare in the trenches and in the skies. The case of sound ranging, a kind of anti-ballistics, by contrast, concerns the establishment of a completely new field in the military technology. And here's just the British example. Combating or averting attacks through complicated localization techniques was made possible through a combination of results and equipment from basic scientific research in very different fields, ranging from electrocardiography to metal conductivity to sound recording and filtration or even to gestalt psychology. 
This development hence demonstrates a new quality in the connection between science and warfare that makes it seem appropriate to refer to the First World War as the First Scientific War. Against the backdrop of this new quality, which first emerged in the course of combat operations, one must ask how mobilization, self-mobilization, and re-mobilization of science took place. Physicists, in particular, took part in all this military research. Many of these physicists came from the fields of modern atomic and quantum physics and had, in particular, in the years before the war, established a close-knit international community. They would also re-establish this community in the interwar era. And here are some, just, uh, some, some German scientists as illustration. During the war, they found themselves on different sides of the front lines where they nevertheless dealt with very similar problems. The crucial deficiencies of ballistics, es ballistic expertise, which became apparent on all sides early in World War I, were due to the largely unforeseen challenges of extensive trench and aerial warfare. Fortified military positions had to be attacked from above, with mortars firing at steep angles. Similarly, firing at zeppelins and aeroplanes required not only steep angles, but also acute launches against moving targets. Even when aggressor aircraft could be visually located, range tables were not sufficiently reliable to target them. Nor was it easy to calculate locations with sufficient haste for all relevant conditions. This common problem turned out to require considerable eff research efforts among all the combatants and with strongly differentiated results. The majority of scientists were deployed at first as ordinary low-rank soldiers in the war. Disillusioned through their experiences at the front, only then did they reconsider how they could best apply their skills to bring about military success. In addition, tragic death of most promising young scientific talent or of important scientific leaders, such as Henry Mosley in Britain and Friedrich Hasen Earl in Austria, may have changed attitudes. The first to get involved in sound ranging of enemy artillery was apparently the French artillerist Charles Nordman, an astronomer from Paris. On his own initiative, he began using precise watches to measure time differences to deduce the locations of the enemy artillery. These rudimentary attempts convinced his superiors to send him to Paris to further develop his ideas. At the Sorbonne, he found a scientist able to record the weak sounds of lower frequencies. Lucien Bull had worked on recording heart sounds through electrocardiography. Already in November 1914, the French had a functioning method which was deployed in the field mere three months later. The British later developed the concept of this French method into a fully fledged system, but initially, in many cases, I quote, the French were ahead of us, in, of ideas. The French were ahead of us in ideas. In, Germany's, in Germany, besides the still anecdotal story about the violinist Fritz Kreisler, who allegedly was able to hear with his ears alone the range of fire from Russian artillery at the East Front, genuine efforts of sound ranging emerged during regular duty of physicists in the trenches. The Munich physicist and wireless pioneer Jonathan Senek suggested apparatus with string galvanometers already in late 1914. The Leipzig physical chemist Karl Friedenhagen was reported to have been to has, Friedenhagen was reported to have been such excited of his invention that he had to be rescued by his commander from within a hail of shells, which apparently so well verified his cal calculations. 
His sound ranging invention from March 1915 later included electronics to register the artillery noises. He was sent home to develop a working system which, however, was deployed only years later. In Britain, the military was less receptive to scientists' suggestions. Uh, Lawrence Bruck described an, quote, almost impassable barrier between the military and the scientific minds, and probably we have to take this with a grain of salt as we have uh, learned this morning. In 1915, the British purchased a French apparatus, and the first British division for sound ranging reached the front in October 1915. Even though the technology was far from satisfactory at that point, the first breakthrough occurred about a year later when the Tucker microphone improved the system considerably. At this point, the British could now display their organizational skills. A sound ranging school was established. By the end of the year, Lawrence Bragg and his people inducted a personnel consisting of 34 divisions with over 1,000 soldiers in the operation of this new high technology. When it comes to Germany, we mostly have to rely on in indirect sources to map the development of sound ranging. In addition to letters and recollections of scientists involved in their work documents yet to be studied more fully, there are also military reports from British and American sources. These reports and the studies that have used them offer a systematic, albeit at times partisan, insight into the German case. If one follows the recollections of Max Born, who as a 32-year-old on the day of the outbreak of the First World War received Max Planck's offer to take the chair of the Berlin Physics Department, it becomes clear how strong the solidarity between scientists was and how culturally distinct the scientific and military communities were. While Born's asthma kept him from frontline duty, his colleagues, Richard Courant from Göttingen, mm -hmm. Rudolf Ladenburg from Breslau, found themselves at the front since the outbreak of the war. It was here that the idea of instrumentalizing the sciences for war gained momentum. Courant developed earth telegraphy in order to avoid the chaos of messaging that so often prevailed in the trenches. He recruited for the home front several colleagues from Göttingen who used the fields before the gates of the city to simulate the front situation and carry out experimental research. Rudolf Ladenburg, for his part, was the driving force behind the establishment of a specialized group of scientists within the Artillerie Prüfungskommission. With this unit, this unit was responsible for all methods of scientific measurement. And uh, in this uh, context arose the first German project of sound ranging. Ladenburg immediately encouraged his friend Max Born to take part in this group and more physicists followed. And what at first began as a military scientific project, thus later became a rescue mission in order to spare talented scientists from the fate of became, becoming cannon fodder. According to Roy McLeod, a reason for, the Germany's, for Germany's failure in sound ranging lies in the late mobilization and in the tenacious adherence to inadequate theories and methods. Furthermore, the German preference for the subjective, subjective system based on a human re observer had crucial repercussions on the German war effort, and the influence of this subjective system needs to be explored probably best with a cultural historical approach. This was a quote by Roy McLeod. In Born's recollections, however, this had less to do with a specifically German culture of knowledge that, say, revered the human factor, but was rather a result of a contingent development. Born was fully aware that, I quote, the proper physical way of measuring short time intervals, such as, 
as occur in sound ranging is by electric recording with the help of an oscilloscope. But the firms which could supply such apparatus were overworked and could not accept a big new order. So they had to stick to stopwatches, but this rough procedure, Born uh, remembers, worked better than one would expect. It also fits into this perspective that the rudimentary sources at hand on Karl Fredenhagen's invention allow at least to deduce that from early 1918 on, the Germans too used objective procedures which allowed, by use of an oscilloscraph constructed by Professor Fredenhagen from Leipzig University, to locate at least six simultaneously firing artery batteries at once. The development of the device had been concluded already three years earlier, as I mentioned before, but it was employed only in the last year of war. It is hard to tell, but the author of a paper on war um, cartography discussing Fredenhagen's work was quite sure that this device, quote, should have been superior to the similar British apparatus. In order to escape the mostly futile questions of failure and super superiority, which have dominated the comparison of the various scientific efforts for the war, it might be instructive to follow David Bluer, who analyzed anti-aircraft sound ranging apparatus in a different way. He arrived at the thesis that sound locators came in national styles, and even if two national developments arrived at rather similar solution, he added, it may well happen that this common solution is then rejected by one national group and accepted by another. The key insight is that it is social processes that determine technology when it is constructed by a group of various people from different backgrounds. This brings the questions of mobilization the relation between the scientists and the military, and the processes of production, training, and deployment of technological artifacts to the fore. While Roy McLeod's, quote, German preference for the subjective system based on a human observer appears from this point of view now both too nationalistic and too general, design decisions may well have their root in the specific interactions within the different groups which were constructing, testing, and applying the technologies in the battlefield. The blanket question whether the mobilization of science in Germany occurred to a lesser extent than in the allied countries can be made more precise when one asks whether German physicists negotiated the priorities of war research and basic research differently than British or French scientists who left their research to win the war. One could furthermore ask wherein, one can furthermore ask whether herein lies the reason for Germany's scientific success in the post-war period. That there did not exist a total mobilization in Germany is evident, for instance, in Max von Lauer's commentary on Max Born's appointment to professor of physics in the University of Frankfurt in December 1918. In addition to his scientific talents, Born also had, quote, great diligence. Even in the past years, when he was senior engineer in military service at the Artillerie Prüfungskommission, he could still publish a series of important papers. A more precise comparison that could demonstrate the extent to which basic research was prevalent during wartime still, however, needs to be made. If the German, if the Great War was the first war in which science and technology was on a grand scale mobilized, that is, ideas and technologies became mobile to flow between the two otherwise rather unconnected realms of the military and the academic worlds, what would then happen after armistice with respect to this mobility of insights and artifacts? 
In principle, we can identify two types of direct conversion. War developments that entail results of knowledge which directly flowed into science, even of basic and theoretical kinds, and specific war constructions and artifacts that were taken over by civil technology, which eventually brought war inventions to the consumer. In addition, however, there were, were also various kinds of indirect conversion, when, for example, methods of mathematics and physics, which were invented, developed, and improved um, during the war, were transferred to different fields to the extent that an outside ob observer hardly could make out any relation to war and destruction. While during the war, Max Born, um, Ernst Ladenburg, and um, Ernst von Angerer mentioned only known specific war physical word, work on a postcard, publications exhibit the actual research. In 1921, von Angerer and Ladenburg published a paper on the propagation of sound in the free atmosphere in the Annalen der Physik. It was based on over 500 experimental series undertaken mostly in the Flanders Plain using vast resources of the military authorities. It explains how a grid of sound sources and registration apparatus was set up. Details about the registration apparatus, a double string galvanometer which deflected light onto a film strip and allowed measurement of time difference as small as two, uh, two thousandths of a second, were presented in another journal where the military origin of the research was disguised even more. Putting all information together, others being unpublished calculations of Max Born, we can recognize a fully fledged research project which apparently simulated the artery fire in safe distance behind the front lines. Born, who did not publish his work, showed, for example, in the case of a layered atmosphere with a given wind gradient, sound rays would propagate from the origin of the ground to a certain height and then go down again so that the sound would reach distant, a distant listener slightly from above and in less time than the sound on the surface would need. It was this effect the war physicists had just researched when they wrote their postcard to Arnold Sommerfeld, and later they checked its validity also with bean aureal sound locators. The conversion of the war researchers on artillery and anti-aircraft sound ranging into pure scientific papers which omit all reference to military application is one thing. Even clearer, however, became the reintegration of knowledge gained on war problems when Ernst von Angerer used his, this research for his habilitation thesis, the pre re prerequisite for becoming a professor in 1921. Also, Paul Langevin, also Paul Langevin's war research in France provided a good example for a direct conversion from war-induced innovation to post-war technology. Granted, the idea of an active ultrasound ranging underwater emerged already after the Titanic catastrophe, but only with the German U-boats and their ever waning and hearing sounds did it become urgently necessary to realize this concept. Over the course of the French development, Langevin transformed Piet's electricity into an innovation for the improved detection of ultrasound underwater. After applying this technology successfully in spring 1917, Langevin reversed the phenomenon with piezoelectric quartzes. He created ultrasonic transmitters. And given the latest amplifier technology of the French military telegraphy units, he was able to produce a powerful quartz transmitter in a laboratory tank. Through this new technology, though this new technology no longer played a large role in the war, it gave immediately rise to diverse basic research projects. The passenger steam line ship, steamship Ile de France, 
which commuted between Le Havre and New York since 1927, advertised, for instance, its sondeur ultra sonore after Langevin's model. The scientific impetus from the British scientists who turned politicians and anti-aircraft listeners for a time was, according to June Barrow Green, <coughs> of great importance, though in a more general and indirect way. Researchers like Fowler and Mayan, who never, who before the war had dedicated themselves to pure mathematics, turned afterwards towards more applied fields, such as the statistician, statistical mechanics, such as statistical mechanics or astrophysics. Archibald Hill, who wrote later pointedly, Kaiser Wilhelm and I jointly did good service to science in diverting both Fowler and Mayon from pure mathematics to other fields. But not only scientists were led by the war to other fields, but scientific contents and methods wandered from one territory to another. In 1921, after hearing a lecture from Niels Bohr on the new atomic theory, Douglas Hartree turned his attention to calculating electron orbits in the atom. Fowler encouraged him to use numerical calculations to derive better quantitative predictions from Bohr's model. What Hartree in the following, under, following undertook was an adaption of his scientific success from war years, only that, to put it simplistically, that it was no longer shells that flew towards enemy positions in airships, but now electrons that moved with the magnetic fields and around the nucleus. Interestingly, it is not possible to read up on the exact methods of Hartree's reform in his publications on ballistics like that in Nature of 1920. At best, one can find mention of this uh, reform in a, in a textbook of anti-aircraft gunnery published shortly thereafter, albeit classified. Rather, Hartree first wrote openly about his methods in his publication on the magnetic divergence of beta rays, in which he calculated the trajectory of an electron that had been directed through a slit at a fixed position. At this point, one can find a description of the system of differential equations and its transformation through which it became possible, quote, that the varied trajectory goes through the same point of the slit as the normal trajectory, which is easily made using the adjoint system. In other words, the same target could be hit under varied conditions. Naturally, the connection between military deployment of missiles in war and the description of the behavior of elementary particles on the microscopic level are not so <coughs> close in all cases. Nevertheless, in Hartree's case, perhaps more so than for his older colleagues, the questions and methods of solving the problem of war ballistics had crucially shaped his approach in the later years in the field of atomic physics. Hartree was concerned with computationally reproducing some of Lawrence Bragg's experimental results. He was able to transform the calculation problem into a new system of equations now solvable with just a 10-inch slide rule and a table of squares. In this way, he attempted to explain X-ray diffraction images of rock salt, which Lawrence Bragg had determined based on Bohr's atomic theory and thereby give credence to the reality of the atom as small planetary systems. Later, Hartree would, would methodologically refine this approach in his self-consistent field method. Although Hartree's method resulted from the calculation of mathematical, of mathematical factors in the scattering of X-rays based on Bohr's orbital model, it could nevertheless still be used and further developed even after the establishment of quantum mechanics. For Bragg, Hartree's perspective implied no less than his credo for X-ray crystallography, the structure that led to the best arrangement agreement with the measurements 
should also be able to count as the best approximation of the truth. In this sense, the atomic model, which were completed according to Hartree's calculated dimensions of eccentric electron orbits and exhibited at the 1924-25 British Empire exhibition in Wembley, probably also offered Bragg the best depiction of atomic nature. The foundational idea of what became the Hartree-Fock method, which we owe to Hartree's ideas from the First World War, or rather, if you will, to Archibald Hill and Kaiser Wilhelm. The examples given so far are by no means exhaustive, perhaps not even representative. However, they may have served the purpose of demonstrating the various direct and indirect um, ways in which war's repercussions made a difference to post-First World War science. Besides research and techniques from ballistics, the field of anti-ballistics using sound ranging left some lasting impact. Clearly, in applied fields like electroacoustics, they were of particular importance, but more strikingly, there were also strong relations to pure th science. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, so, any questions? Uh, I'm going to hand this round uh, so that everyone can hear the question. I've got a, a roving microphone here. Uh, th 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 thanks very much, uh, uh, indeed. Um, can I take a work? Does it work? Yeah. yeah, does it work? Yes. I think it's working. Good, okay. Um, the, 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 uh, the question of, of the relations between uh, the military uh, community and, and the scientific community before, before 1914, in, in perhaps in comparative perspective, um, presumably some, um, some, some of the, the, um, the Germans that went to the front, just like the French, had been in the reserves and were therefore uh, uh, um, uh, called up for military service at the beginning of, of, of the war, whereas the, the British would presumably have to volunteer in the initial uh, in the initial uh, year or so of the of the of the war so the, the question is how many how many of the people that went to the front in 14 uh, were or were um, uh, already expected to by, by, by virtue of being being uh, in the in the re in in the reserves the second point um, there's, a, there's an assumption made in, in a lot of the commentary on, on the non-use of of, of research at the beginning of the war, that the war was going to last as long as it actually did. Whereas the assumption at the time was, of course, that it would last uh, a, a, few, a, a very few months, uh, if, 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 uh, if that. If one puts that into the, s to the, s to the story, does it, does it look different? Well, I, I guess it... it um it resonates very well, these two developments. The one I sketched, that it um, needed the experience in the trenches to start thinking about scientific solutions to the war problem. And the longer this grew, the, the greater was the uh, motivation to come to solutions from, from a scientific and technological fields. Clearly, we, we have this great um, uh, who are patriotism in the beginning, and in, in Germany one can really say, at least for the um, cities, it was um, universal. It was, di didn't uh, distinguish between different people coming from different backgrounds, and we know this infamous um, uh, uh, 93, which signed a declaration that they completely, scientists, that they completely agree with the German uh, military uh, that what they had been doing in, in, in Belgium was, was, was okay, it must have been very reasonable. So, um, but this um, was, uh, is an interesting uh, point showing that um, even scientists have, say, different persona. They, they are the members of a society, they more or less um, identify with the uh, Kaiserreich system, 
they, this is a system with new racial stem, at least the academic um, uh, people. So this, this comes, say, very natural. And uh, this may also explain why there, it took some time that probably also in the military, one realized that although it seems, say, fair not to um, uh, pick out scientists and give them different duties as the ordinary soldiers, that uh, at some point it, it makes sense at least to listen to them. And so what we, we have from the SCAN sources is that there were many, say, um, suggestions what, what could be done. And the Kuran example, I think, shows very uh, clearly how the academic system was mobilized for inventing a new um, communication uh, technology, earth telegraphy. And then this was deployed. And then this became, say, um, professionalized, that, that the army sponsored units, like the sound ranging unit and the artillery Prüfungskommission, uh, which then um, really used very elaborate uh, scientific um, uh, approaches to calculate the propagation of sound in atmosphere. And now it becomes difficult. Isn't this a basic science problem? And clearly it is, but it was uh, motivated from a very special situation. And, and clearly after the war, as Ernst von Angerer, you can sell it to your university as a purely scientific paper strip off, and, and they even mentioned in the paper, well, we did most of the experiments in the Flanders Plains, which from now, now, nowadays, as a reader, you, you, it comes a bit surprisingly to read this, but at this time, it seems to be perfectly all right. And, 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 and so I think we, we are still in a process of trying or to, to understanding some mechanisms which were at work. And so the problem is that, um, uh, for example, I have been mentioning quite a lot about, say, the, the objective uh, sound ranging uh, efforts from the German side. But all these sources I've found so far are very sketchy. There are some you can read in the British and American F, uh, reports that there seems that the Germans also came across with some system, but we don't have any evidence. And there is now a colleague of mine, Roland Wittje, who had studied in the archives, or had found in the archives quite some good material to show what in the last year of war actually happened, and that the German systems came very near to this, what I started from, say, this perfection uh, um, British things. And my main uh, thesis uh, clearly was that it doesn't make to compare who did better, but rather to understand that this competition really fostered various research fields. We've got time for one more question, I think. Slide. Um, we've, it's a general point, I think. We've had uh, three talks so far where acoustics was at the centre um, in one way or another. We've had a mention also of Lord Rayleigh, whose acoustics textbook is on the shelf of anyone who does acoustics. Um, I hadn't realised that, that Bourne did acoustics work, and the kind of work he's doing there on sound propagation is exactly what you do now for wind turbines, oddly enough, um, to estimate what the annoyance is going to be. Um, is there something about acoustics that brings in a certain kind of scientist or mathematician, or is it that they were just told, this is what you're doing, because this is what we need done? Because they all, they all seem to have left acoustics afterwards. Well, in a way, it's um, ironic that these quantum and atomic physicists were working on acoustics. <laughs> but uh, as one can infer from, from Max Born's recollections, it turned out to be very attractive mathematical problems. <laughs> and so, in a way, they could, um, if one, well, very, uh, very, very roughly um, try to make comparison, if you, if you think of wave mechanics in the 20s, so um, the, these kinds of uh, mathematical machinery which you can apply on, on quantum physics also can be applied on acoustics. And clearly, the um, 
the, say, the traditional acoustics, and now I have to admit that my knowledge about Rayleigh and other th books are, uh, is not this perfect, but I guess, um, which is a general um, f um, quality of these uh, mobilized scientific work, that you have to approach a field of knowledge from a different direction. If you would just extend the traditional work on acoustics and think about sound propagation, you would have proceeded from one step to another, but maybe you, 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 it hadn't occurred to you, you that you have to combine the different layers of atmosphere and wind changes at the same time. So in this sense, clearly, it, it is a, it's a war defines specific problems to be solved, which otherwise had not come across or hadn't come across at least at this time or at this early time and, and so on. Good. Well, um, I'm, af I'm afraid we've run out of time. No, all right, no, go on then. There's <laughs> a so coffee break as well. Did they discover the jet stream? The jet streams? Yes. And this is, I mean, this was something that was the result of the activities in the Second World War, but it's from what you've told me, the kind of research that you've described is precisely what might well have done that. But apparently not, from your expression. No, no, I, uh, it didn't come Shame. across to me. Yeah. No contribution to meteorology. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I think we should... Um, Thank uh, Dr. Schermacher for a very interesting talk. And <laughs>